As Christians, we would like to believe that everything that we believe regarding our faith and everything that we do in our faith is based completely off scripture. But is that always the case? Perhaps inevitably over the last 2000 years, tradition has also started forming part of the reason of why we do the things we do and why we believe the things we believe about our faith. And tradition is not in of itself wrong or evil. Tradition can be good as long as, like Jesus himself said, it does not come against the commandments of God. The Pharisees in the first century, certain Pharisees, at least who came against Yeshua, were very much idolizing their traditions to the point where they were nullifying the commandments of God. A lot can happen in 2000 years. And I want to submit to you that a lot has happened. What we would like to do as Christians, I believe we all would like to do is to understand what did the early church look like? What did the beginning, the root, if you will, of our faith look like? Because when we have a picture of that, we can accurately look at ourselves and see, do we do that? Are we imitating the picture that the Messiah was for us? Because that's what I want to submit to you. The early church set out to do. They wanted to imitate their Messiah, the one who came to die for their sins. So the early church was a continuation of Jesus's ministry. But something happened. Some some of what we see in Jesus's ministry and what we see in the early church some of it has gotten lost along the way over the last 2000 years. And there are a few factors to do with it, I believe. If we look at the, 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 the ministry of Jesus, we see that he and his apostles and his disciples and those who came after them, even after the resurrection of the Messiah, they walked in power of the spirit. We see that they also walked in great holiness and reverence for the truth. They followed him with all they could and they loved him and loved his ways. But even though these apostles and all of the early Christians and Christian leaders were Jewish, and even though the Messiah himself was born a Jew, lived as a Jew and died as a Jew, today, when we look at the Jewish people and we look at Christianity, there is a great separation. Something went very wrong along the way. I want to submit to you that this separation is partly responsible for why we don't see the church walk in all the ways that we saw the early church walk. In this video, we are going to be analyzing what did the early church look like? How did they walk? What happened in history? for this separation to occur. And why is it important for us to know and understand it? Because I want to submit to you that if we understand why the separation really occurred, we can fix what went wrong. We can restore what has been lost along the way to our faith. And we can restore the early church model back into the modern day of today. And with that, we will see the same revival the early church did. I want to submit to you that we have for long been crying out and waiting on God to bring revival. I want to submit to you that it is our move and that God is waiting on us because he has given us the revelation. It is not only up to us to learn and apply it. I remember when I was in high school as a Christian boy growing up, one day after school, as I was waiting for my parents to pick me up, I was sitting with a friend and we had, were in a conversation regarding religion and our beliefs. And he said something interesting. He said that 
the Jews are responsible for crucifying our Messiah. And that's why they are now separate from Christianity and even in his mind, abandoned by the Father, Father God. This kind of ideology, this idea is not just something that was introduced to a teenage boy, but it's been something that's been pervasive even in the church today. Similarly, Jewish people often teach their children that Jesus is teaches that the Torah is abolished and that he taught against the keeping of the Torah. And so what we see is that both parties, both Judaism and Christianity has been teaching their children that the other party desecrates what they value most. The Jewish people perhaps value the Torah above many things, and it's to be valued as the word of God. And so when they are taught that this other man, this leader of the Christian religion, this man called Jesus is against that thing that the Jewish people hold as sacred. Well, why would they ever lend an ear to anything Christianity has to say? And if the Christian children are taught that the Jewish people killed the Messiah, the one that they value most, well, why would there be ever any consideration or love or compassion for Jewish people who did this abhorrent thing? You see, brothers and sisters, I want to submit to you that both of the things I just said are lies. They are unexplained. They are lacking in information and context. And because of the lack of information, because the full picture has not been given, they are lies. Because if inf- when we say something and we do not fill in the blanks of the whys and the whos, we are spreading a lie and teaching a lie to our children. And our children inherit lies. And I want to submit to you that you perhaps have inherited lies too. Let's let's consider why these statements are wrong and evil in this teaching. And and my hope is for you to see what the father says in his word, because I don't really care. I don't know about you, but I don't really care what a man or a denomination has taught. I want to know what the Bible teaches. What does God say regarding these things? The history of the early church and the separation between Judaism and Christianity is historically complex. There is not one single answer or reason for this, but rather this was a gradual separation that occurred over many years. Yet it's very important to understand why it happened. I think that you will soon see that with it, that no party was innocent and both Judaism and Christianity made a lot of mistakes along the way in their in the relationship between these two groups as we have them today. In the first century, something incredible happened. In fact, we are in the year 2020 because we are counting back from that event. You see, a man came on the scene and was born into the world. He was born a Jew. He grew up as a Jew. He was raised by Jewish parents. He kept Jewish customs. And he was a Jewish Messiah. His name was Jesus. In the first century, he was also perhaps more known as Yeshua because that was his Hebrew name, which his Hebrew parents would have called him by. And so he, this Jewish man became, grew up to become a rabbi, a teacher, and he came to start teaching regarding this God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he was saying that he was the fulfillment of the promises that God made to the Jewish people. 
amongst others. A promise that started with Abraham. Abraham was not a Jew himself because the Jewish people did not exist yet when Abraham was around. For the Jewish people only came when the 12 sons were born, sons of Jacob. And the Jewish people made up a, only two to three of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so now God comes and he blesses the Jewish people amongst the other tribes. And we see that now there is a promise made to them that there will be a Messiah that will come from the line of David. When Yeshua came on the scene and he started teaching, he was teaching from the Torah or what we call today as the Old Testament. He was using what was scripture back then, for there was nothing else written yet besides for what we know as the Old Testament. And as he was teaching from that, people's ears were opened. There was repentance that followed his speaking and his preaching. But not only it was not only a ministry of words, not just a ministry of truth, which would be majestic and wonderful in of itself, but it was a ministry of spirit. The Holy Spirit of God rested and entered into the Messiah. And as Yeshua walked, he went and he healed people of infirmities. He healed broken hearts. He healed blind eyes. He raised the dead and did many other confirming signs that confirmed his role as the Messiah. And not only that, he gave the same authority to his disciples and to all who would later accept him as their Messiah. Now, firstly, I want us to look at Matthew 5 because I want us to see that he was not against the Torah. Do you remember one of the first lies I talked about in the beginning of this video, which the Jews are often taught? They are often taught that the the Messiah of the Christians of Christianity teaches against the Torah, that he teaches against keeping the Sabbath, that he teaches against keeping the law, that he is against that, that he abolished that. These are some of the things they believe. But look at what he says. Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua did not come to start a new religion. He did not come to throw out that which his father gave the Jewish people and the world through Moses on Mount Sinai. That thing we call the Torah. He did not come to abolish that or throw that out or away. And he says that I don't care who you are and you can even be a Christian, call yourself a Christian or a believer or a follower of the Messiah. You can call yourself whatever. But whoever relaxes the least of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And he says he came to fulfill them. He came to give them meaning. He came to teach them. He came to show how they are to be kept how the father intended them to be kept, how the father intends us to walk truth out, how the father intends us to walk in love and to bring life and blessing to our and our lives and the lives of others around us. You see, in the first century, there was no such thing as a Christianity that was distinct and separate from Judaism. You see, what we when we say the word Christian, what it means is we have the word Christ, which means anointed one. And then this this word Christian simply means a follower of the anointed one. Now, in the first 
century and when the Messiah was around and walking on earth, we established and discussed how his followers, his disciples were Jewish men and he was a Jew himself. And so really a more accurate description of the movement in the first century and the early stages of the movement was that it was rather a Jewish Christianity because they were Jewish people who were following this. All the early followers were Jews. When we read our Bible, we clearly see that. And so we see that this form of Jewish Christianity was different from the Orthodox rabbinic Judaism in the first century. You see, when we say the word Judaism today, often we think about rabbinic Judaism. But you need to understand that in the first century, just like we have 33,000 plus denominations in Christianity, there were many denominations within Judaism, many sects and movements that they were the Pharisees, they were the Sadducees, and there were other movements as well. And this movement of people following the anointed one, Christians, if you will, they were forming another movement, a part of Judaism, a movement within Judaism, a sect within Judaism. And it was actually called the way. And Paul references this term in his letters. We read in Acts 24 verse 14. But this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. Paul is saying, just like we discussed with the Messiah, he's saying, I follow the way I follow Yeshua, because he is the way, the truth and the life. And that movement was then called the way. And he says, I follow everything written in the Torah and the prophets. Just like the Messiah said, I did not come to abolish the Torah and the prophets, but to confirm, to fulfill, to give meaning to them. Paul goes on to state that this new movement, this new thing that God has given us, in the Messiah, he says a peculiar term. He says it is to the Jew first. We read this in Romans 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This gospel was given for the Jew first because Christ came to fulfill the promises of God to the to Israel, who the Jewish people who retained their identity throughout the ages, they formed a native born part of Israel. So God was was fulfilling the promise made out to Israel. And that's why it's said that it is to the Jew first but to all people, but to the Jew first. The Messiah also confirmed this. He also put exclamation marks next to how important the gospel is to be brought to the Jewish people. We read this in Mark 7 verse 26, where Jesus heals a Gentile woman, but not without explaining the importance of the gospel for the Jews. He says, now the woman was a Gentile, a Seraphician by birth, and she begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, even the dogs, however, under the table, eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. 
When Yeshua told this woman, let the children be fed first, the woman understood exactly what he was saying. She was a Gentile. She was not a Jew. When Yeshua said the children should get of the bread first, he was referring to the Jewish people, like Paul said, to the Jew first. And he was saying it is not good to take from the Jewish people and give to the Gentiles. And so she understands what he is saying. She understands that you're saying it, this is for the Jews, the, 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 the confirmation of who the Messiah is, the miracles, the freedoms, the, all of these things that he came to do. It is for the Jew first. This is what he is saying. But he, she says, but Lord, if I can just get a crumb falling from your table, that would be enough. And this show of faith was what let the Messiah smile and say, go in peace. For healing has come for you. In Matthew chapter 10, he also goes on to say when he first sends out his disciples that they should not go to the Gentiles, but to the Jewish people. Matthew 10 verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. Jesus is saying, go nowhere among the Gentiles when you go and do this great commission. The first time he tells his disciples in this context. But this does not mean that he never sent them towards these people. In fact, he later did. He, in fact, even ministered himself to many Gentile believers and Samaritans. And and one of the hallmarks of his ministry was that he was open to giving the gospel and to open the door to the God of Israel to all peoples and not just to Jewish people. So he was not he was for all. But it is important still to see that his heart was very much for the Jewish people. In fact, even though the Great Commission given to the disciples were not for them to first go to the Gentiles, years later, when the church became more established and was uh, bringing in a lot of Gentiles into this faith called the way to follow the Messiah, we see that there was a great influx of miracles happening in this church. We see the early church had great miracles follow them. A great continuous revival was occurring all the time. We read, for example, about this in one of the historical writings of Irenaeus and his writing against heresies too. He wrote this in 180 AD and we read the following. Wherefore, also those who are in truth, his disciples receiving grace from him do in his name perform miracles so as to promote the welfare of other men, according to the gift which each one has received from him. For some do certainly and truly drive out devils. So those who have thus been cleansed from evil spirits frequently both believe in Christ and join themselves to the church. Others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and other prophetic expressions. Others still heal the sick by laying their hands upon them and they are made whole. Yeah, moreover, as I have said, the dead even have been raised up and remains among us for many years. And what shall I more say? The early church was full of miracles and wonderful things. Listening to this firsthand testimony, would you not want to be a part of that kind of church? You see, brothers and sisters, we are starting to see now that that Yeshua's coming was a continuation of God's relationship with Israel. That our New Testament picks up where the Torah and prophets leaves off. God is not starting a new religion here. 
He is continuing in the promises he made Israel. And this, like we talked about with Abraham, is how God came and promised to promise Abraham that I will give you a descent, amount of descendants as many as the stars in the heavens. We now know that those descendants are physical line, like as in the native born Israelites and who the Jewish people today form a part of. And it also goes further into a spiritual seed. Abraham brought for from his line is not just physical peoples, but spe- a spiritual people, a pe- people who are Gentiles, people who are not knowing God, who are who are who are pagans in their background, but who saw him as glory and accepted him. They all become part of Israel. They become grafted in to Israel. This is not a new concept, but even at Mount Sinai, at the foot of Mount Sinai, when the commandments of God were given, it was given to the native born Israelites, as well as the mixed multitude. Mixed means different kinds of peoples and multitude means many peoples. See, there were many other people who came out with Israel, not just native born Israelites, but Egyptian pagans. When Egypt was being struck with plagues, some of the Egyptians wanted to follow God and they came out. Pagans, other kinds of people who did not know God before, but saw his glory. They came out and at the foot of Mount Sinai, they all said, we want to follow you. And those commandments were given to them all to follow God with. And that was that promise of the for for the world to come back into relationship with the king of the of 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 the heavens, uh, our father, God is being fulfilled in the Messiah. Now, when he comes. So if there were all these people at the foot of Mount Sinai, a mixed multitude and native born Israelites, And if the seed of Abraham is both physical as well as spiritual, and if the Messiah came for all peoples, both Jew and non-Jews alike, to bring salvation to all who would believe, then why is it that there is such a separation today? Why is it that Judaism and Christianity seems to be at odds with each other? It's even though they worship the same God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the same God who came, the Messiah, Yeshua, came to preach. Why is it that they are all with their backs turned against one another? You see, there's various reasons for this, and we're going to explore them. One of the first I want to talk about is how these groups throughout history, especially from the first century onwards, became distinctly persecuted. You see, from the second to the fourth century, especially, there were times in history where Christians were persecuted and there were times when Jews were persecuted and they were persecuted as distinct groups, separate groups. And the persecution was actually part of what made them more separate from one another. We talked about how it was Jewish Christianity, that sect called the way that it was at first. It wasn't separate yet, but this gradual separation occurred with persecution being one of the reasons. One such persecution is known as the Bar Kokhba revolt in 123 to 138 AD. This is where the Romans harshly persecuted Jewish people and Christians were not persecuted to the same degree. We read following the battle of Bethar, wherein 580,000 Jews perished in the war and many more died of hunger and disease. The Romans plowed Jerusalem with a yoke of oxen. Jews were sold into slavery and many were transported to Egypt. Judean settlements were not rebuilt. Jerusalem was turned into a pagan city called Alia Capitolina, 
and the Jews were forbidden to live there. They were permitted to enter only on the ninth of Av to mourn their losses in the revolt. Hadrian changed the country's name from Judea to Syria Palestina. In the years following the revolt, Hadrian discriminated against all Judeo Christian sects, but the worst persecution was directed against religious Jews. He made anti religious decrees forbidding Torah study, Sabbath observance, Jewish courts, meeting in synagogues, and other ritual and religious practices. The Romans were in authority during this time. And you need to think about what it's like to be a Roman. If you are in the shoes of a Roman, you identify a Jewish person based off their appearance, brought on by their practices. You see, someone who is a Jew would do typical Jewish things in their eyes. They would keep the Sabbath. They would keep feasts. They would eat a certain diet. They would have this kind of appearance, right? These Jewish kind of customs in their eyes. And this is how Jewish people were identified. So people who were Jews were kicked out of the city. Anyone who had this kind of custom, this kind of appearance. And this included even Jewish Christians. That is, Christian believers, those following the Anointed One, the Christ, the Messiah, who were following also similar Jewish customs in the eyes of the Romans, they were also kicked out. And so there was a start, there's a pressure now for people, even who may identify as followers of the Messiah, to abandon some of the things that the Romans see as being Jewish, even if these things are biblical. Because if we abandon these, these certain instructions or these certain things that the Messiah did, the Romans would not, because they would not classify them as Jews, because they only used a few things to classify Jews by. And so now you can see how it would be quite easy if you are going to be kicked out of a city to compromise and say, you know, I'm not going to, I am you you telling a Jew, a a Roman person, you know, a Roman leader or a Roman uh, policeman, a soldier of that time, right? I am not a Jew because I do not follow these Jewish customs and Jewish practices so that you can stay in the city. While those who did not, who said, I will not give up these things because my Messiah did these things, they would be kicked out. And so this split, this is this, you can see now there are some people who would go out, who will leave the city and be forbidden and barred from entry. And there will be others who would stay and perhaps even compromise. Furthermore, what we also know is that the Those who were recognized as being Jewish Christians, Jewish people who followed the Messiah, they were also receiving persecution from rabbinic Jews. So the Orthodox, uh, rabbinic, uh, those certain Pharisees who came against the Messiah in the first century, many of them were also persecuting these Christian Jews because they did not want to join them within this Bar Kokhba revolt. Because the Bar Kokhba revolt, when the Jews rose up against Rome, was led by a man who some Jews believed was the was a Messiah, was the Messiah, even though he was not. Some believed he was. But the Christian Jews knew that he was not a Messiah because they their Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, had come already. And so because they didn't want to join the rabbinic Jews hand in hand in this revolt against Rome, they received a lot of persecution. Some of them were even murdered and killed for not joining because they were seen as traitors to Judaism. Another form of persecution 
that was partly responsible for this gradual separation between Judaism and Christianity is the Fiscus Judaicus. In the 70s AD, a new law was being passed by the Roman Empire by the emperor called Vespasian. This law was had everything to do with something that is quite familiar to those of us familiar with a certain passage of scripture. In Matthew 17 verse 24, we read about how Yeshua was confronted by Peter about temple tax. And he told Peter to go and pay the temple tax, which was half a shekel for Peter and half a shekel for Yeshua. They went and then that's when Peter went and he went to fish for a fish and out of the fish's mouth, he got the coins, right? So this famous story is regarding the, the famous temple tax that was around in the first century. And so after the destruction of God's temple in the first century by the Romans, we then had the Roman Empire put in this law, which was that this half a shekel that used to go to the Jewish temple would now be redirected to go to a Roman pagan temple that was built in its place. The, the Jupiter Capitolinus temple. And so this tax was imposed upon all Orthodox Jewish people. It was also paid by uh, Jewish Christians. That is people who are of the bloodline of being a Jew, but who now believe in the Messiah. And it was also imposed upon Gentile Christians as we see, know them today. You see, the, the thing is with this law is that it was written in to be applicable to everyone who practiced Jewish customs, just like we read in the previous act of persecution that the Roman Empire had. And so but because we're talking about 70 AD, this is very early on in the movement. This is like the first century, right? And and the Roman people, they classify Jews as anyone who keeps anything that looks like a Jewish kind of custom. And that's why Jewish Christians, as well as Gentiles, people who are not Jewish in bloodline, had to pay the tax too. Because in the first century, brothers and sisters, this is important. People who were non-Jewish Christians were practicing things that people would today even consider as Jewish customs because they followed a Jewish Messiah who was Yeshua, Jesus, a Jew. We read this in the historical record as well. The Fiscus Judaicus was originally opposed upon Jews. At the time, neither the Romans nor the early Christians considered Christianity to be a separate religion from Judaism. If anything, they would have considered themselves as a sect within Judaism, which historians refer to as Jewish Christianity. However, whether that was the intention or not, it did not take long for Christians to petition the emperor to distinguish the Christians for the purpose of the payment of the Fiscus Judaicus. As the tax only applied to practicing Jews, if they could be recognized as a separate religion, they would escape the impost. This was written by Borg and Jonathan, the Jewish Christians and the Jewish tax. So some Christians petitioned the emperor to be considered as a different religion entirely from Judaism instead of how everyone previously considered them as a sect within Judaism. And the reason for this was simply to evade a tax. You see, now to do this, to be able to say we are very different from Judaism as Christianity, they had to convince the Romans of this. And just like we've discussed earlier, the only way to really show the Romans this 
is to change your appearance, to stop practicing things that have a Jewish association with them. There were certain things that the Romans considered very Jewish in their custom. Something like the Sabbath, the feast days, the diet of the Jews, the dress of the Jews, which included wearing zitzits, the fringes of the garment that the um, woman who was bleeding grabbed onto when to get healing from the Messiah. Remember that story? So the Jews wore the zitzits on the four corners on the fringe of their garments. Furthermore, they, the Jews also met in the synagogues every Sabbath, right? That's where they read, read the Torah. That's where they study. It was one of the most important places of worship and study for the Jewish people and Christians, Jewish Christians alike. People who are non-Jews or Jews, but people who are believers in the Messiah, and so they had to start giving up some of these things. Those who were considering themselves Christians who wanted to evade this tax. Then the petition was heard by the Romans and they put in a reform to this law. The essential part of the reform was to redefine Judaism as a religion. In the words of a Roman historian of the early third century, only those Jews who continue to observe their ancestral customs will be liable to the tax. So Christians were now seen as non-Jews and were not liable to the tax as long as they would give up those Jewish customs that we just mentioned earlier. The unfortunate reality is that some of these Jewish customs, quote unquote, which they gave up due to for the sake of um, avoiding the paying of this fiscus Judaicus tax. These weren't just Jewish customs. They were biblical commandments. There were definitely instructions or customs that the Jews rabbinic Judaism was following that weren't biblical instructions. However, the w Christians weren't following them anyway. Christianity, even those who were Jews, those who weren't Jews, they weren't following the rabbinic traditions that went against the commandments of God. That's what Yeshua, their Messiah, spoke against. They were concerned with biblical instruction. But some of them even forsake biblical instruction for the sake of avoiding this tax. And the unfortunate reality is that this was one of the foundations of early Christianity because it happened as early as in the first century. So from as the years went on, because of the persecution for keeping certain commandments, certain commandments were avoided, abandoned, labeled as Jewish. And even today, many of these instructions are labeled as Jewish and abandoned because of persecution or because we want to avoid the Jewish label. The second big reason that we'd like to discuss for the separation between Judaism and Christianity is anti-Semitism. As we discussed, there were Gentiles who are now coming into this faith that the Messiah opened the door to. Gentiles who had pagan backgrounds, no knowledge of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob prior or any of this, and certainly no knowledge of the quote unquote, Jewish scriptures known as the Torah and the prophets back then. For these scriptures were learned and studied within the synagogues where the Jews met every Sabbath. And so because of this, we need to remember that we are now seeing a bubble of knowledge that is in the Jewish sphere. We have the Jewish people having handed down centuries upon centuries of revelations and knowledge about the Torah and the prophets and and all the study that's been done by them. It's locked into their culture and their minds and their who they are as people, right? The, the pagans didn't know of any of that stuff. And so now we have these pagans coming into the faith 
And initially, their leaders are Jews because their leaders are also their messianic Jewish believers who believe in the Messiah. And they're able to teach these Gentiles the truth regarding the scriptures about what they've been having in their hearts about and in their minds about the scriptures, that which they've been learning hundreds of years and talking about for hundreds of years in the synagogues. Romans 3 verse 1 says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So, as we discuss, the first leaders of this Jesus movement were Jewish leaders like the apostles and the very men who God entrusted to write our New Testaments for us to. But soon Gentiles were raised as leaders too. Some of these pagans started, were taken under the wing and discipled, and they started becoming more learned in the word. They were not as learned as the Jewish rabbis who became believers, but they started becoming raised as leaders, such as Timothy, for example, who Paul raised as his disciple into leadership. And though these Gentiles, some of them had a fear of unbelieving Jews and their heresies. And for good reason, because the many of the unbelieving Jews, those who did not believe in the Messiah, had many heresies and they tried to bring in many heresies into the church. And our Messiah even spoke against these. And in our New Testament, our, the authors of the New Testament often spoke against these. So there is good adequate reason to be wary of some of the things that were being said by non-believing Jews. However, there was a stereotype and an anti-Semitism that started growing in, in the hearts of many non-Jewish believers, and especially some of the leaders. Much like in our modern age of today, where there is anti-Semitism all over the world, we see the Holocaust that happened with Nazi Germany, and there are many such atrocities that have been done against the Jewish people throughout history, and in the first century it was no different. The world as a whole did not like Jews. There was anti-Semitism. And even in the church, among the Gentile Christians now coming in, there was slowly but surely a growing anti-Semitism that was coming and being brought in from outside that was already in the world and now coming inside of the church. And so some of these non-Jewish believers who raised as leaders but they did not have the understandings and knowledge of the Torah and prophets and of the scriptures that were handed down from Jew to Jew through the generations. And because some of them had anti-Semitism, they had no interest in even learning anything from a Jewish person because they started believing because of the anti-Semitism in their hearts that Jewish people have nothing valuable to share or add to their knowledge. So this puffed up pridefulness against the Jewish people, who the, who this, what the, which the scripture says, Paul wrote, the oracles of God were entrusted to them. But there were many church fathers and church leaders in the early days who refused to open their hearts to hear any of this knowledge. For example... We read in the epistle of Barnabas in 130 AD that Christians properly understand the Hebrew scriptures, especially the laws of the Torah, while they, the Jews, do not. The epistle of Barnabas shows us this closed off nature that was already in the hearts of some of these anti-Semite believers. To understand why this happened and why this is a big deal, you need to understand what the meeting places of the first century and the first few hundred years of Christianity looked like. Firstly, there were home meetings. Home meetings were very common. Home meetings was the personal uh, fellowship place where everyone went 
to go and they went on a weekly basis. They went there to worship. And then we had the synagogue. The synagogue was more a public beggar meeting. And this was the central place of study. So remember that in the first century, people didn't have smartphones. In fact, they did not even have Bibles like we have them today. They had Torah scrolls. And to own a Torah scroll was something that most men would never be able to do. Because it would be too expensive. Because they were handwritten. And so the only places that could afford a Torah scroll were very were either very rich people or it was within the synagogues. And the synagogue was a public place where you could go and study the Torah. And so this is where Christians met too. Christians went because they needed to study the scriptures because that's what where you went to study the scriptures. You didn't have a personal Bible. You didn't have a smartphone. That's how you did it. But see, because Christians, there was this growing anti-Semitism in the hearts of many of the Christians. Some of them didn't want to listen to Jews. Some of them didn't even want to go to a synagogue anymore. And so because of this, they grew, there was a growing separation between Christians and the knowledge that was within the scrolls in that synagogue. John Chrysostom is known as one of the greatest church fathers of Christianity. Between 344 to 407 AD, he was around and he wrote the following regarding the synagogue. The synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is the den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts, the temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, the refuge of brigands and dubashis and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a house worse than a drinking shop, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, a refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same about their souls. As for me, I hate the synagogue. I hate the Jews for the same reason. This hatred for the synagogue and hatred for the Jews that this church father amongst many others and as they had means that this knowledge of the scriptures was now locked within the walls of the synagogue away from them and locked within the minds of Jewish people away from them and in their pride of saying that we don't need to know anything about what the Jews have to say inevitably a lot of the knowledge was now becoming more lost along the way. Because see, brothers and sisters, you need to remember that there were believing Jews in the first century and beyond, even until unto today. There were believing Jews. But the church fathers, uh, some of the church fathers in the least, and many of the Christians, they painted all Jews as the same. And e- whether they believed in the Messiah or not, They considered their knowledge of the scriptures and the oracles of God as to be of no value. They can say they Christians, many of them believe that they don't need any of that, that they have the they have the full ability to reinterpret in many cases God's word themselves. Please do note that what we just read was around 300 between 300 and 400 A.D. So this was a few hundred years after the Messiah. We are not talking about the first century now. We are going further into history. And you'll see that as we go further into history, the anti-Semitism just increases. No matter what the Jews did, as John said, it would be no reason to hate the synagogue or hate the Jews. The Messiah did not call us as his followers to hate anyone including Jews, whether they believe in the Messiah or not. While this church father in three to four hundred AD wrote that in the first century, our scriptures say something else. A different message is given in the book of Acts 15. 
verse 19, we read, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. At this Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15, it is said that these Gentiles who are coming into the faith, it was decided that they should do a few basic instructions to begin with, for they will get the rest in the synagogues. Because that's why they're saying, for Moses is being read every Sabbath in the synagogues. The Gentiles were encouraged in the first century by the apostles and all of the leaders to go to the synagogues. For that is the only way that they will be learning the word of God from a people, the Jewish people who have been entrusted with the word of God, the oracles of God, and who are able to relay it to them. The Messiah even said the same. He said in Matthew 23, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but they don't practice. The Messiah encouraged his own disciples to listen and hear what the scribes and the Pharisees say when they are reading from the scriptures, the Torah scroll, but just to not do what they do because they are hypocrites, they practice they don't preach, they don't, they don't practice what they preach. So, furthermore, brothers and sisters, I want us now to have a look at the consequences of this. What are the consequences of Christian Christianity not just separating more from Jews because of you know choosing to abandon certain instructions because of persecution, or whether it's because of the anti-Semitism. What are the consequences of this? I would like to introduce you to a man called Marcion. In the late second century, a new movement called Marcionite Christianity started taking more form and gaining more influence. And the influence that it gained was quite substantial. In some places, it even outnumbered the uh, orthodox views. In other words, there were more people in some places who believed Marcionite doctrine than the orthodox Christian doctrines. So what is Marcionite Christianity and what did Marcion propose? He looked at various things within the Bible. He looked at the Old Testament. He looked at the New Testament. And he came to the conclusion that even though both the Old and the New Testament are created by gods, the Old Testament came from a different God than the New. And that the Jesus God of the New Testament is different from the Father God and the Old. He said this because he could not reconcile how these two documents, if you will, as we what we call the Bible today, which make up the Bible we have today. He could not see how these two form part of the same narrative. For example, with the wineskins in Mark chapter 2, verse 22, where Yeshua, where Jesus comes and tells us about the new wine that you can't put new wine into old wineskins. He believed that that is in reference to how you cannot go and uh, have the um, New Testament and New Covenant ideas with what was before. It is incompatible with the Torah and the prophets. This view is actually even today in many churches, prevalent. Maybe not to the degree where Marcion had it, but they do believe that the Old and the New Testament are somewhat incompatible with one another and that the New Covenant brings in a new idea that is doing away with the Old Testament 
In fact, it's quite interesting because when Marcion stated this regarding the wineskins, the early church fathers rejected him for this reason as a heretic. In short, the proto-Orthodox Christians won Marcion. Marcion Christianity, in its original form at least, did not survive past the 8th century. However, this victory where Orthodox Christian views prevailed was a two-edged sword victory. And what I mean by that is that it was good and bad. Because the good of it was that it secured the Hebrew scriptures as relevant and important for Christians back then and even today. But unfortunately, the Christians who won over Marcion in the debates and arguments were anti-Semites. They did not like Jewish people. They did not like the way that the Jews interpreted scripture at all, whether they were believing Jews or not. And so because they were anti-Semites at heart, many of their anti-Semitic ideologies were adopted into Christianity more and more as the years went on. Some of the Christian leaders who was leading these arguments were Justin Martyr and Tertullian. And they were anti-Jewish and anti-Old Testament in some of their beliefs. You see, brothers and sisters, here's what we have. We have Marcion, who comes from a Gentile pagan background, who comes and believes that the God of the Old Testament is a different God from the God of the New Testament. We have Justin Martyr, we have Tertullian, we have all these other people who are now part of the Orthodox Christian movement, which they did good work. Do not get me wrong. And, and I, we are grateful for many of the passions of the church fathers that contended for the faith. However, their backgrounds were Gentiles. They were pagans in their background, too. And they were divorced in many ways from the Jewish scriptures because of what happened, because of the anti-Semitism, because of the separation that by this time has already been pretty clear between Judaism and Christianity, between the knowledge preserved by the Jews, and the lack of the knowledge now with many of these Christian leaders. And so these leaders now were looking at the Old Testament through the lenses of this lack of knowledge and ignorance of the scriptures. So they were trying to fight the ideas of Marcion and trying to reconcile the Old and the New Testament. But they were trying to do so in the wrong ways. You see, they believed that the Old Testament belongs to Christians and not to anyone who considers themselves a Jew. Which is in direct contradiction with what the scripture says, as we already established, that this, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Secondly, what they believed is that literal interpretation of the Old Testament is never, well, very rarely a good way to go about interpreting the Old Testament. But that figurative interpretation is usually the best way to go. Because thirdly, they believe that figurative interpretation of the Old Testament is the best way and sometimes the only way to reconcile with what we read in the New Testament. But see, brothers and sisters, the problem with this is they did not understand the Old Testament the way they could have. And so they had to resort to figurative interpretations to reconcile and to defeat Marcion's arguments. Now, why, what do we mean by literal and figurative interpretations? For example, Justin Martyr said that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where God commanded his people to remove the leaven from their homes, and that is like a picture of how we remove our sin from our homes. Justin Martyr said, we are not to literally keep the instruction, 
but only figuratively understand it. Now, there is great value and incredible importance in understanding the figurative meanings behind something like the biblical feast days or the Sabbath, the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. There is great spiritual edification and understanding that, yes, taking the leaven means we are removing this sin from our homes or or keeping the Sabbath is how we rest in the finished work of the cross. These figurative understandings has value. But see, it was not just that he taught that these figurative understandings replace the literal interpretation of that. We literally have to keep them. So literally, we don't need to actually rest on the seventh day. We can rest any day we want as long as we understand what it means. We don't literally need to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of Passover in any way. Not, we don't need to keep any of those customs as long as we figuratively understand what they meant. Do you see how when we start applying figurative, uh, exclu- figurative understandings exclusively to many of the Torah and prophets instructions, how we can lose on so much of the value. You see, there is value not just in figurative understanding, but literal obedience. Because God uh, designed his instructions to be obeyed literally, because it is in the obeying of them that he teaches us the figurative means. This is what they did not understand. And unfortunately, even though they won Marcion, which was wonderful, they did not understand that there is still value in actually keeping the instructions. To conclude this section, Marcion basically taught that the Old Testament is so weird that it must be from a different God. These church fathers who in the end had victory over Martian's arguments, they reconciled it. They said, well, the Old Testament, yeah, there are some things we don't understand in there because we have been divorced from its understandings because of our anti-Semitism. Yes, we don't understand it, but we can symbolically still get value. So we don't have to literally do anything. So this is kind of how they compromised in trying to win over Martian's arguments. Instead of simply saying we can literally understand and obey and we can have figurative lessons to learn from it all. The irony is that while Marcion's official movement died around the 8th century, many of his ideas are still very much alive today. And even though Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and other church fathers fought vigorously against Marcion for the very right reasons, they unfortunately compromised and even adopted some of the very things that Marcion really brought forward. And in in its essence, that is the desecration of the Torah and the prophets, where it is not as important, not as doesn't have as much meaning, it is a strange thing. It is something that has, does not have as much relevance as the New Testament writings of today. Hosea 8 verse 12 says the following. Were I to write for him my laws by the tens of thousands, they would be regarded as a strange thing. Unfortunately, many churches and denominations today Consider the Torah and the prophets a strange thing, even though we all can agree that it is inspired scripture by God. Not all of us can agree of its relevance to our lives. And that is perhaps most evident in how in the average church service of today, the Torah is rarely studied in death. But in the first century, it was. They went to Sabbath every to the synagogue every Sabbath, and they went to study in depth the Torah and the prophets. It was incredibly relevant for the first century early church. They could not go without it. And with that, on top of that, they had the writings of the New Testament authors, the letters circulating through the churches and the house churches. And that was great. There was great uh, relevance to them. But 
see they had they gave relevance to everything they did not throw one thing out and compromise here or there they welcomed it all and saw it all as relevant some of this anti-semitism comes from the idea and the lie that's been spread within christianity even to today that the jews were the ones responsible for the crucifixion of the messiah but is this true? You see, brothers and sisters, I want to submit to you something. In the first century, when our dear Messiah was crucified, the Jewish people as a whole weren't the ones who cheered for his crucifixion. Were there many Jews who did? Definitely. But the leaders, the Jewish spiritual leaders of the day of rabbinic Judaism, in essence, those certain Pharisees who came against the Messiah in his earthly ministry, they were the ones who conspired against him, who spread lies and false accusations. They are the ones who caused him to be crucified in the end. The general public weren't all on board with this. There were many Jews, even in fact, the followers of the Messiah, who were all Jews, mostly at least, who were not on board with this. So how can we say that it's the Jewish people and make a painted with the same, everyone with the same brush, all the Jews are responsible for his crucifixion? Is that truly fair to do? Furthermore, I would like to read Romans 3 verse 9, because I want to submit to you that even the Jews who were directly responsible with their hands to crucify him who have the blood on their hands i want to ask are is the sins unique to them or are they unique in their sin are they the only ones who truly put him on the cross romans 3 verse 9 what then are we jews any better off no not at all for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And so we all are responsible for crucifying Christ, because it is our sins that he died for. If none of us had any sin, if you had no sin, if I had no sin, he would not need to be crucified. But see, we all have sin. Therefore, the only man who can say that he was not in any way responsible for the crucifixion of the Messiah is the man who has no sin. And the Bible just taught us that there is no such man, that we all have sin. We all have fallen short. We all have denied and in essence hated God because of our sinful nature and by our actions and deeds. But he calls us now into freedom, but not to point the finger at our brothers and say, it's your fault. It's your fault. That's pride. We have to point the finger at ourselves. So to say that the Jews crucified the Messiah is an incredibly prideful statement. And it's a lie in of itself. We ought to point the finger at ourselves. And so this hatred for the Jews, this anti-Semitism that men like Justin Martyr had, it spilled into their writings. Because, see, they saw, just like the Romans in the first century, they saw that the Jewish people had certain things they did that made them who they were. Like, for example, they kept the Sabbath. They kept the biblical feast days, which are biblical instructions. But these are very outward things. Like if you do this, you, everyone can see you're doing it. If you're going to the Sabbath, every synagogue, everyone sees that. So you're getting recognized by these customs, even if it's a biblical custom instructed by the Messiah and God. But so see, Joseph Martyr, even as a Christian now, goes and he rejects these instructions, these biblical commandments because of the connection an appearance of Judaism that it has, even if it is just as part of Christianity, actually, as it is supposed to be part of Judaism. So we see now what Justin writes in dialogue with Trifo between 138 and 161 AD. He writes, your Sabbath days and in a word, all your festivals 
if we were not aware of the reason why they were imposed upon you, namely because of your sins and the hardness of heart, given to you as a distinguishing mark to set you off from other nations and from us Christians, the purpose of this was that you and only you might suffer the afflictions that are now justly yours. And that you that your land may be desolate and your cities burned with fire and that strangers may eat your, the fruit of your presence and not one of you may go to Jerusalem for you are not recognized among the rest of men by any other mark than your fleshly circumcision. Accordingly, these things have happened to you in fairness and justice for you have slain the just one. This church father, Justin Martyr, says something quite interesting Unbiblical, though. He states that the reason that the Jewish people received the keeping of the fa biblical feast days, as well as even the Sabbath, was because of the hardness of their heart and because of their sin. He also accused them of crucifying the Messiah, which we already addressed. But the reason that God gave mankind the Sabbath, or the biblical feast days, were not because of our sin. In Genesis 2 verse 3, God created the Sabbath day with creation before sin even entered the world. He also then says when Yeshua, he walked, Jesus, he said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. This is not an instruction that was given because of our sin. This was an instruction given because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a blessing created for mankind to bless mankind because God recognizes that we need to rest and have a date with him, a time set aside with him. Furthermore, the biblical feast days were not given to the Jews because of their sin and hardness of heart, like Justin says. No, the biblical feast days were given as an annual reminder to cleanse our hearts from sin and to repent and to come to the Father and worship Him and celebrate Him and to look forward to, to the prophetic calendar He has given us to, his, to how the feast days point to His coming, how the feast days have pointed to His resurrection and His sacrifice, etc. If you want to learn more about the festivals, we have many teachings regarding them on riseonfire.com. Justin Martyr boasted that these commandments are the Jewish feast and the Jewish Sabbath who belong to the Jews because of the sins of the Jews. But he does not understand that and when these instructions were given, to, it was given to the 12 tribes of Israel, not just to the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Benjamin or the tribe of Levi. But all 12 of the tribes and not only to the 12 tribes, but to a mixed multitude on top of that of people who are pagans who wanted to just come in, who weren't native borns, like we've discussed before. And so they don't belong to a singular group like the Jews. They are for the Jewish people, but they're also for all people who desire to follow the God of Israel. My point is simply that pointing at the Jews like our, some of our church fathers and Christianity did, many of these reasons are quite ridiculous and have no basis that are biblical. These arguments are ridiculous because they stem from an anti-Semitic reasoning. God calls us, though, to remove ourselves from these lies and to love our Jewish brothers, even those who do not believe and who may have many faults, or to love them instead of hating them like many of the church fathers did. We are there to be an example to them, of what it means to walk in spirit and truth after the Messiah who was Jewish and who came for the Jew first. While Christians look down upon Jews for crucifying the Messiah, Jewish people were also not completely innocent in this. People who are non-Jews or Gentiles were considered unclean in the first century by the Orthodox Jewish community and Jewish culture in general. We see an example of this, of how God had to even show Peter, one of the 12 apostles, that he should not call 
any Gentile or any man unclean. Acts 10 verse 28. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me I should not call any person common or unclean. This vision that God gave Peter of the unclean animals coming down had a purpose of showing Peter that his Jewish belief that was not a biblical belief, but a tradition of the Jews to call Gentiles unclean, to not associate or talk with them. God came to show Peter that that was unbiblical and was going to stand in the way of the gospel. Contrary to what many teach, God will not actually show Peter that he can eat whatever he wants. But the purpose is very clearly outlined here. Do not call any man unclean that I consider clean because a man does not become unclean because of what they eat. It can be wrong to eat bad things, things that aren't instructed by God to be considered as food. But it's not good to consider someone as lesser because of what they eat and cut them off from the gospel. That was the message God had for Peter. And so this Jewish belief was also coming in the way of Jews accepting that this Messiah could be teaching what he is. Because the Jewish mindset was that the Jewish Messiah would never come for Gentiles because The Gentiles would not be included in the covenant. But God had a plan to always come for a mixed multitude and a native born Israelite. And so because of this belief within the Jewish community, many Jews refused to accept that Yeshua, Jesus was the Messiah because they didn't believe that he would go there. However, on the side of Christianity, The Christians weren't innocent in this either. In the later years of the movement, more so, from 300 AD onwards, Christianity started stripping this Jewish Messiah more and more of his Jewishness, of his Jewish nature, of the fact that he did Jewish things, including keeping God's commandments Biblical commandments, like the way that he ate. Many Christians today would think nothing weird of Jesus eating bacon or a pepperoni pizza or having pork. However, historically and biblically, we know that that was impossible and that he did not do that. Peter said at that point, I have never eaten anything that is unclean. So Peter never got the memo from the Messiah that he can eat whatever he wants and that no, he never touched pork to eat. Messiah never touched pork to eat. He only caused the demons into pigs. That's all he did with pigs. Right. So but Christianity started stripping him, him of this of who he was. And because of that, now the Judaism The Jewish people, they see a Messiah who is supposed to be Jewish, stripped of his Jewish Jewishness. And he now eats pork. He now breaks the Sabbath. He now doesn't, uh, you know, he's not supposed to keep the biblical feast. Apparently, he doesn't look like a Jewish person anymore. He doesn't look like a Jewish Messiah. And so because of that, the Jewish people get blinded for seeing him who he truly is. On top of this, he was starting to become more and more promoted as a Western, pale, white skinned Jesus who looked very little like the Jews would have looked. Uh, And with all this, he's just getting more and more alienated from the Jewish people. Now, of course, what race Jesus truly was does not really matter. But it does matter for the Jewish people. It matters because he had to be a Jew, because he had to come from the line of David, according to prophecy. He could not just be anyone, according to what the Bible says he's supposed to be. 
And so if we strip him from who he really is, we're stripping that identity away from him that confirms who he truly is. So then he cannot uh, confirm prophecy like before anymore, especially to, to the Jew first, who he came for. We read in 2 Samuel 7, 12 about this prophecy he is to fulfill. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. To David it was said that from his body will come this Messiah to build a kingdom. This man had to be a Jew. Brothers and sisters, Paul confirmed this. And he said, do not boast against the Jews. He said in Romans 11 verse 18, do not be arrogant towards the branches, the Jews. For if you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Through our stripping of the Messiah of his true identity, whether it's from painting him as a Western non-Jewish man to saying that he would eat bacon or making fun of him in that way, or making jokes like that, which is ridiculous in of itself, to saying that he would break the Sabbath, he, would, he doesn't care about the feast days, that he even abolishes the Torah and that he doesn't care about whether we walk like he does. In obedience to it. Whichever way, maybe it was our anti-Semitism, our hatred for the synagogue and for the Jew. Whatever it was, Paul says, no matter what, you do not boast against the Jews. You do not boast against the branches. How can you be a light to them if you boast against them? How can you bring this Messiah to them who is supposed to be for the Jew first? If you are only concerned with being better than they are and looking down upon them. I hope that this part one of this teaching has blessed you. In part two of this teaching, we will be going into more detail. I hope that this is getting you excited and opening your eyes to the beauty of our Messiah. In part two, we're going to go even deeper into what the early church looked like. We're going to talk a little bit more about the effects of anti-Semitism. We're going to talk about replacement theology. We're going to talk about the lies spread in Judaism about Jesus. The history of the biblical Sabbath. The history of the biblical feasts. And how to be a light to the Jewish people. For that is ultimately one of the big purposes of this series. I want to show you how you can be a light to your brother Judah. But the only way that you can do that is if you understand the history, understand where we as Christians, especially as non-Jews, have fallen short in reaching them. So we can bridge the gap and provoke the Jews to jealousy as we are instructed to do. For that is one of the main purposes that God has revealed the truth to you that he has revealed to you. I'll see you in part two of this teaching. I hope that this teaching has blessed you. Subscribe to this channel for more just like this one. Like this video, share it with your friends. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Shalom.